case under Windows, but I can tell you that under other operating systems like Mac OS X or, or Linux, you can absolutely use the one and only GPU you have. The main issue is that if you only have one GPU, uh, and that GPU is also being used for visualization, while you are running your CUDA kernel, that GPU becomes unresponsive for any other use. And so if you were to run a calculation that takes a minute, during the time that that kernel is running, uh, that GPU will stop responding to windowing system operations. So even things like moving the mouse cursor around, the mouse cursor will freeze because it's on the host machine is unable to continue uh, talking to the GPU. But in this, just as a follow-up, but in this yeah. case, um, when you're doing the, the manipulation, that, that doesn't happen. Yeah, it, well, it, it, in my case it happens too, but it's just very short because I'm trying to keep these calculations down to a fraction of a second. So they, the mouse cursor would indeed go, it, it'd look a little bit less smooth. Instead of being drawn every single pixel as it is dragged across the screen, what you would see is it will sort of hiccup and go <laughs> uh, if the calculation is fast enough. This is one of the reasons if you've read the CUDA programming guide, they warn you that uh, under Windows in particular, any CUDA kernel that's running on a GPU that's being used for display, if it runs for more than two seconds, they may kill it. Windows will do this automatically. This is sort of a Windows policy. And this has to do, if, if your GPU becomes unresponsive to Windows for more than two seconds, Windows assumes it's dead, and then it basically reboots the GPU out from under your kernel and resets it. And this kills your kernel, and then you would have to basically start over. And so uh, if you're planning to write a program that runs on laptops, you have to pay special attention to how long your kernels are actually going to run for. And it's a good idea to limit the number of work units that you're running in a single kernel launch so that it's unlikely to run for more than, say, a second and a half. Otherwise, you run the risk of having Windows kill your, your process. So I wanted to uh, tell you exactly that. When I went home, I tried to run uh, on Windows a kernel just fooling around with it. And I had VMD open. And when I would run it, I was looking at the structure. When I would run it, VMD would close. Interesting. So. Yeah, uh, I'd love to see that. I'd be curious. Uh, well, uh, I will say this. If, if uh, Windows kills your CUDA context, it will kill all of mine, too, probably. You know, because that's what they do. They take a very scorched earth policy. If that GPU becomes unresponsive, they just kill it completely. They uh, basically nullify all of the active processes that are attached to it, and they restart the driver effectively while the machine is running. And so anything that was running basically gets you know, eradicated. So. Back to the algorithm. Yeah. So you're gonna I'll show much more of the algorithm as we go along. Yeah. Uh, well, then maybe, well, I'll ask the question and you can tell me if you answer it. So, so you have these S orbitals, right? You have these P orbitals and the D orbitals, mm -hmm. and they have different functional yes. form. Well, so the, yeah, they, uh, they have oh, different uh, angular momenta. The, yeah. And there's recursive relations, I guess. Between mm -hmm. Did you do all the S's like in a thread block? And then no. We do, I'll show you. Okay. You'll see. Uh, we, we have a loop, basically, that processes all the different orbital uh, components within one thread. So each thread does all of its own work. And I'll show you how we do that. Okay. So uh, to distribute the work dynamically among all of the GPUs, we in VMD I have a set of routines for managing this pool of worker <coughs> threads. And they have a, a shared counter, basically, uh, that's protected by mutex locks. And so what happens is each of the workers calls a routine, in this case called uh, thread pool next tile. And what that does is it, it fetches a tile that has a beginning and end, like a start and an end index of work units. It's really very similar in principle to the uh, thread indices that you have in CUDA. So I describe the work as a, bunch, a range of indices, and then all the workers know what that means by virtue of various parameters I give them. And they then are assigned a range of work units every time they ask for one of these tiles. They go off and compute their work units and do whatever they were told to do. And then when they run out of work uh, from that tile, they basically check again 
to see if there's more work. And basically they keep doing this loop until there's either no more work left or there's a cleanup for any GPU that maybe failed to complete its work. And so this is another reason why I developed this uh, little framework for, for VMD. In order to make your code robust, in, in the case that one of the GPUs has an error or another, pro in, in particular for VMD, life is a little harder because we're going to be running on desktop computers and laptops where we are not the only application running. It is perfectly uh, reasonable to expect that while VMD is running, the user might run another program that ends up allocating all of the GPU memory out and we go to allocate one more little uh, array of memory and, and we're told no. And if that happens, what do we do? You know, in the case of a cluster, you typically have the whole node to yourself and so you're the only application using that hardware and it's much easier to deal with. But in the case of a desktop application, at any time, even after you're well into your calculation, something else could come along and, and tie up a uh, resource and basically not uh, give it back. And so we have to have a way of, of coping with that problem, other than crashing. <laughs> and so the way we do this in VMD is, every time one of these workers is in their little loop, uh, requesting work units and things like this, if something happens during the body of this work loop, and either a memory allocation fails, or they get an inappropriate result, like a not a number, or or they get one of these windowing system calls that wipes the GPU off completely, uh, we basically have a little routine they can call that sets an error flag that tells the, the, uh, their peer workers that they can't continue. And that they're, they're bailing out, they're giving up, they've done the work they can do and they can't do anymore. And when that happens, then that failed work units uh, basically get put on a little queue or stack and then their peers will, when they've finished all of the main work that they were assigned to do, the last thing they do before they clean up is they basically go and see if there's any other work units that are left from their peers that may have been failed work units or something like that, and they basically retry those. And if still those work units can't be done, let's say that there is, for some reason I, I have some work unit that is requires some hardware feature and none of the GPUs in that machine have that hardware feature, then I can have that one work unit percolate its way through all the, you know, all the GPUs will give it a shot and try to do it. And if none of them can do it, then it, it remains at the very end of the calculation and the host can look at that last work unit that didn't get done and say, well, what's up with this? And it could uh, then pursue doing a cleanup routine for itself. So that gives us also a sort of a, a more elegant way of dealing with exceptional cases where I can write the code in a sort of consistent way regardless what calculation we're actually trying to do. And it can make its way through being attempted by all the GPUs. If they can't do it, then it falls back to the host and the host can finally clean that up. So um, I was giving you an example of um, the, the times involved in waking up different threads. So these are timings in microseconds. You probably can't read this from way back in the back, but it's on the USB key. And so these are uh, the time it takes for launching a CUDA kernel. So that's about eight, micro, eight microseconds just to launch a kernel. So this is just a good order of magnitude. If we're going to do things at an interactive rate, we need to see what it costs us to launch a kernel, what it costs us to wake up a group of these worker threads that are sleeping. So that's about 10 microseconds. Uh, if we actually go wake up a, a pool of those worker threads, launch a kernel, and, or, and, and then go back to sleep again uh, without doing any real work, that's 20 microseconds. If we do all of that, fetch one tile from this global uh, work index counter, and then go back to sleep again, 21 microseconds. Then if we do all of this stuff and do basically a tiny Hello World CUDA kernel that actually calculates a few addresses and then immediately exits, that's about 30 microseconds. If we do the same thing uh, and we have each of the workers do 100 of these work tiles that are basically, you know, they're no-ops or they're effectively empty work units, that's on the order of uh, 1,400 microseconds. So that's sort of a lower bound. It, we need to have about 100 different uh, large core screen comp computations in order to load balance GPUs that may have a significant variation in performance. So, 
this is really the number that's interesting to me. If I'm going to have two, one, two, three, or four, uh, let's say, GPUs, and one GPU might be as much as 15 times faster than the slowest one, if I want to achieve a reasonable load balance, I have to have at least 100 work units to distribute to them for those ratios to work out with that dynamic load balancer. And so that means that I have the overhead for doing all that's about one and a half milliseconds. That's well fast enough. That, that's pretty good. I mean, it, it could be better, but that's good enough that if I had very simple kernels to, to do, I could do them at a rate of, uh, you know, about six or eight hundred of them a second. So that's pretty good. Does that include time to return to BMD? Yes. That's all the time to, all the round trip all the way back, including all the memory copies and everything. So that's sort of, I did all these tests basically to determine, well, how fast could I ever get? It will never be faster than this. This is doing, like I say, sort of a very, very simple CUDA kernel. I will never have anything that's this fast. So anything I, I can do, the fastest I can compute these things across a pool of GPUs of up to, up to four is about 700 of them or so a second, something on that order. How dependent are these numbers on uh, the family, the GPU family that you're using? So the numbers are definitely better if you're using the newer generation Intel CPUs. So to give you an example, I think just the CUDA and, and the newer versions of CUDA are faster too. <coughs> so I did all these timings and I emailed them to NVIDIA and I said 8 microseconds seems like a long time for a kernel that does no work. <laughs> and you know, so I talked to them about this and their newest versions of CUDA running on an Intel and the Halem, they have shaved that down to about six microseconds or five and a half in the fastest uh, cases. So with the newest hardware, the newest CUDA, and the fast CPU, we're down to about 60% of this time. And so the rest of this time is basically code that I wrote. So I mean, this is, this is of course, you know, the absolute lower limit. This is very important. And, if we're doing 100 tile fetches, we're multiplying this times 100 times. So 800 of the microseconds here is probably kernel launch time. So that's worth noting. But it's not all the overhead. I also have overhead in all of this thread scheduling code and all that stuff too. So now we get on to the actual calculation of the molecular orbitals for one thread. So for one uh, lattice point, the sort of inner loop of the calculation we're actually going to go over is a bunch of nested loops, an outer loop over atoms, a subsequent inner loop over shells, loop over primitives, which compute these contracted uh, Gaussian type orbital coefficients. And this uh, contains by far the most uh, computationally demanding part of the work, which is calculating exponentials. So this is one of the things that makes the GPU so much faster than the CPU for this particular algorithm is the, the, the fact that the innermost loop contains exponentials. On a CPU, calculating exponentials is relatively slow. It can take uh, tens to hundreds of clock cycles to calculate one single precision exponential on the CPU. Uh, on the GPU, there's a machine instruction for this, so it's not a library call, it's actually a hardware instruction, and that's the reason for that is because exponentials are used in shading. So when it, whenever you see uh, in a video game or in VMD, when you see a shiny spot on a sphere that's a reflection of a light source, that is the result of uh, calculation of exponential lighting. And so the, these exponentials are done for every single pixel in every image that ever gets drawn. So they.